A uh, blessed morning, my dear brothers and sisters. Good morning to everybody. Good morning. And um, thank you, Brother Kennedy, for that vibrant and uh, singing. You're not that excited, brother. Just a uh, little bit. <laughs> Wow. Are you blessed today? Everybody blessed? Huh? Uh, Brother Derek mentioned a while ago that uh, every day, you know, when we wake up, another chance in life, it's a blessing. So glory to God for another day that we are all blessed. Can we declare today, I am blessed? Can you say that? I am blessed. I am blessed. I'm blessed by God. See? And sometimes we need to say that. You know? It's a declaration of our love, declaration of our you know, thanksgiving to God. As we often say that uh, we love our spouses, our children, so we must always say that we love God and that we are truly blessed by God. Right. So again, a blessed uh, good morning to everybody. So last week we talked about freedom and we've been talking about a Christ-centered life. Right. You know why? Because everything that you do must be a Christ-centered life. And the Christ-centered life, as we say uh, said last week, is a life that is free from the slavery of sins. You know? We say that will freedom is the power to do what is right. And doing what is right is doing what pleases God. And you see, many thought that real freedom will bring real joy and real freedom okay? or real happiness. For some, or shall we say for many, Real freedom look like this, and I want to have uh, our slide. Real freedom, they say it looks like this. Okay. Real freedom, they say, pursue your dreams. There's nothing wrong with that. They say real freedom is life is short. Brother Mike, life is short. Live it to the fullest. You know, I've been hearing that words, that phrase. Okay. And number three, YOLO. You know that what, uh, what it means? You only live once. Many of our younger generation say, YOLO, YOLO, YOLO. You only live once. Go what makes you happy. You know, the idea behind is whatever makes you happy, you know, go for it. Go after it. But there is a, a big problem with that. Okay. They are going after it without God. Okay. Again, many people, as we have said, are addicted you know, to illegal substance. Many people are addicted to alcohol, into living in together without marriage, into gambling, etc., etc. And many of these people, you know, they wanted to be sober. Many of these people, they wanted to be clean. They wanted to go out of this misery that they are in. Okay. They wanted to quit to whatever addiction they are in. Why? Because they became slaves. Now the question is, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, what got them into that situation in the first place? And the answer is freedom. Right? Because they want to be free. They want to do whatever they want. I will do this and I will do that. I want it my way. I will not submit. Okay? I am the master of my life. Now look what happened to them. Okay? Look at what happened that brought them to their misery, to their so-called freedom. I mean, it brought them to their misery. They become slaves. You see how our mind works? Our mind works counterintuitive. 
those things will only give you temporary joy. Right? Now, let me go back to what real freedom is. For those of you who were not here uh, last week, real freedom is this. Dios. Real freedom is God. Real freedom, Dios, means devotion to God. Real freedom means saying yes to God, saying no to sin. Real freedom meaning obedient to God. Real freedom is being submissive to God. That is real freedom. You see, we thought freedom as we are to as we are to, you know, free to do anything. But it's not freedom. Not being restricted or tied up to anything or to someone. Okay, but as we see again, Christianity, we view it differently. And this is what the Bible had to say. For you are free. For you are free. Yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. And that is clear. God is clear about that. You see, in Christianity, real freedom is actually slavery to God. Again, it is counterintuitive. Being free and yet being slaves. But slaves to Jesus Christ, not to yourself. And you know what Jesus said? For whosoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Again, this is real freedom. Freedom, it's not doing or following your own way. That is not freedom. But listening and doing Jesus' way. When you do it your way, you will definitely lose your life. But when you do it Jesus' way, you'll find life. Amen, brother. Now, living a Christ-centered life is living in full servitude to our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. And that's what we will be talking about today. A kind of freedom that is slave to Jesus Christ. Now, look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and deacons. Now, this is a declaration by Paul and Timothy that they are slaves, that they are bond servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does it mean? A slave or a bond servant comes from the Greek word doulos. If you happen to know the biggest floating uh, bookstore, MV Dulos. Uh, Dulos means servant. Okay. It means one who is subservient, one who is uh, serving, one who is obedient to and entirely at the disposal of his master, a slave. Now, just a brief overview in the history of the Bible. How can one become slave. Now, in the Bible, number one, according in Exodus 21, verse 7, if a man sells his daughter as a servant, so a father can sell his daughter as a servant. Now, number two, as payment for debt. Okay? Second Kings chapter 4, verse 1, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his Slaves. And number three, if you are poor, you can sell yourself. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 47, if a foreigner residing among you becomes rich and any of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sell themselves to the foreigner or to a member of the foreigner's clan. So a slave or a bond servant usually referred to one who has held in a permanent position of servitude, and they were considered the owner's property, personal property of the master. And you know what? As such, the bond servant essentially had no right at all. If you become slaves during that time, you have no right. 
You relinquish your right to your master. They have given up their rights. Now the question, for how long? Okay, for how long will a bond servant serve his master? Okay. According to the Bible, Exodus 21 verse 2, if you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years. Now, if you sell yourself to become a, serv a slave or a bond servant, you will serve your master for six years. And on the seventh year, <clears throat> he shall go free. You are free to go without paying anything. But actually, there is another catch. There is another exemption to this rule. Okay? If on the seventh year, now let's go and read the following verses. If on the seventh year, if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or doorpost and pierce his ear with an owl. Then he will be his servant for life. If you do that wish to leave your master on the seventh year, you will say to your master, I don't want to leave you because I love you. Then you will be forever slave to your master. There's no turning back. Now, there are a few things, there are a few things okay, that must be done. Okay, in, in this particular verse. Okay. First, it was to be made public. It was made to be public with other present. Okay. His master must take the servant, the slaves, before the judges. Okay. And second, the slave's ear must be pierced at the doorpost. Now you have to go to that door. If that is the door of the master, you have to go there. And the master will take a uh, sharp object. And then you have to put your ear on that post. And then the master will drive that object, that uh, pointed object through your ear. Okay? And then you are forever slave to that master. Now the question is, what does those mean? Why pierce the ear? Okay. Why at the doorpost? Okay. Now let us answer first. Why do they need to pierce the ear? Okay. Now this is to make a permanent mark okay, on that person, like a scar. Okay. Signifying that that person gives permission to the master that he will be slave forever. And at the same time, that, that scar, that mark on his ear is a declaration of his lifelong obedience to the master and that it displays that he is already belonging to someone else. He is a private property of a certain person. So when you see someone during that time with an ear piercing or ear piece, you know, he belongs to someone. You cannot take that person. Okay? Now, why the ear? You might ask, Brother Mike, why the ear? Okay? What is the importance of the ear? Let us just go back. In Leviticus chapter 8, 23-24, Moses slaughtered the ram and took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's ear, or right ear, on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. Moses also brought Aaron's son forward and put some of the blood on the lobes of the right ears, on the thumbs of the right hands, and on the big toes of the right feet. Now, ear, it signifies hearkening to God's word. It signifies obedience to God's word. So therefore, a bond servant is all ear. To the master, meaning obedient to the master. Now, important to note as well, it says there, it mentioned about the thumb of the hand, the big toe of the foot. You know, 
The ear is for listening. The hand signify our deeds, our works. And the foot or our feet signify the manner how we walk our lives. Okay? So that is why it is the ear. Now, another question. Why the doorpost? What is the importance of the doorpost? Okay? The master's doorpost signifying that the servant was forever fixed in servitude in that particular household and never to go a free man out of those doors. Okay? Now, because his ear was pissed on that doorpost, the blood-stained door is also a reminder for the slave of his commitment for life to his master every time he passes that door. It will remind him in the first place why he was a slave forever because he loved his master. So those were the meaning of those things. Now, isn't that an interesting idea? Hmm? A slave has no right to go free. Oh, a slave has the right to go free, rather. On the seventh year, he is free to go. But lo and behold, instead of being free, they voluntarily declare that they will stay in full submission to their master forever. Wow. Now, why is that? Why is that? Why do they have to be there and forever be a slave when they can go free? Why? Why? It is because he loves his master. That is the basic answer to that question. Why? Because of the love of that servant to the master. He found a real joy in his master's side that is why he commits his life of service. Nowadays, it's hard to find someone who will commit their life to their master. Okay. Now, Paul said that he was a bond servant. Okay. The moment he accepted the Lord Jesus, he relinquished all his rights and subject himself to servitude to Christ. You know what Paul said? Paul said, but whatever. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for Christ. Wow. You see? You see what Paul said? Whatever I consider gain, I consider it lost for Christ. But, you know, hello. Wait a minute. Okay. Wait a minute. Who is Paul, by the way? Who is Paul, by the way? Okay. Talking about losing everything. Why? Is he rich and famous? Okay. Who is he? Who is this guy? Okay. Talking about this. You know, let, let me just remind everybody who Paul was. Paul was a Roman citizen. Okay. And as such, as a Roman citizen, he had civil privileges that ordinary citizens don't have. Many. Many privileges. I will not go into that details. He was a Pharisee. A Pharisee. Therefore, he was a learned man. And as such, being a Pharisee, he was a member or a part of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is the court, the council, during that time. If you have the courts here, that is uh, the equivalent of Sanhedrin during their time. So he was a learned man. He was rubbing elbows. With who's who in the political system during his time. So he's a famous guy. Okay? And also, Paul was affluent. He was a tent maker. They say that Paul was rich. You know why? Because the fact that Paul uh, supported, supported his um, uh, missionary journeys. Okay? He supported all his missionary journeys signifies that he has a lot of money. Okay? He has great wealth. Now, all of this, Paul said, he count it all lost. Lost meaning garbage. See? For Paul, 
being a Roman citizen, being a man of great wealth, it's garbage to him. It's a trash. What do you do with your trash? Sister Monica, what do you do with your garbage? You throw it away in the garbage bag. Why? Has no value to you, right? Has no value. So Paul, Apostle Paul, considered those things of no value. They are garbage to Apostle Paul. Wow. Now, is this Paul crazy or what? <laughs> you know, do you know people during this time, they would have to pay a huge amount of money just to become a Roman citizen. Huh? Just to become a Roman citizen. But of course, Paul is not crazy. We know that. Okay? He found in Christ what most people in his time and even in our time today, you know, real treasure. He found Jesus Christ. He found real freedom. During that time, Paul was the one persecuting the Christians. He was the one persecuting the followers of Jesus Christ. He was the one persecuting Jesus Christ. Then tables were turned. He is now the one being persecuted. Persecuted by the same group that he was once associated with. Now look at 2 Corinthians again. In our scripture reading, as they servants, are they, are they servants of Christ? I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to that again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Wow. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and I have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Can you imagine what Paul had to go through because of his freedom with Jesus Christ? Can you imagine those things? Did anybody, any one of us, ever experience all this? Raise your hand. None. But Paul suffered. He experienced all of this because of what he saw in Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, you might ask, how can this be freedom? You know, I was asking myself, how can this be freedom? How can this be a real freedom? Can you imagine? Imagine Paul exchanged whatever he has before this, being a Roman citizen, having great wealth, Again, counterintuitive. This is not the normal thinking, right? Can you exchange what you have for this? Now, be honest. Can you exchange what you have for this? Probably not. You see? But Paul, he did. Okay. Now, let me go to one of his experience. In Acts chapter 16, 22 to 24, a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they did not escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks in an agonizing position. You see, Paul was beaten. His feet fastened in an agonizing fashion, uncomfortable position, and inside the dungeon so that he 
will not escape or utter any words about Jesus. Okay? Now, how can this be freedom? How can this be freedom? Now, okay. I want everybody, everybody, including those in our Zoom, I want everybody to read. I will show a verse and I want all of you to read it. Okay? Okay. One, two, three. Okay, again, 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 again. <laughs> okay. Uh, one, two, three. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Did I heard you right? Did I heard you right? Were Paul and Silas singing? Were they singing? They're praying, right? They're praying and singing. Can you imagine? Now, let's read. James chapter 5, verse 13. Is any one of you in trouble? Now, let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. James chapter 5, 13. Now, see. Come on. They are in trouble. James said, if you are in trouble, you pray. That's why they are praying. See? Are they not suffering? They are suffering. Yes, of course. But they are praying. When you are suffering, you pray to God. When you are in trouble, you pray to God. But here's the beautiful part. Are they happy? How come you know that they are happy? They're singing. Hallelujah. Praise God. They're, they were singing. See? They are free. That's freedom for Apostle Paul and Apostle Silas. The disciple Silas. They are free. You see? They are joyful. Okay? Yes, they were happy. They were singing. And this is, the, this is one of the treasures that Apostle Paul found out being a bond servant of our Lord Jesus Christ. Real joy. Okay. There's real joy. And mind you, they were not just singing to themselves. Now, you see again. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners we're listening. They're having a concert. <laughs> They're having a concert there. They're having a good time. How can they be having a good time there in prison? You know, their feet were shackled. Guards were guarding them. They're in the inner dungeon. And yet, they are having a time of their life. You know, contemplating about this. It gives me goosey, goosebumps. <laughs> you see, how can they be singing this in spite, you know, in, in that situation? You see, other prisoners were listening. I don't know, you know how far their voices were heard, but I know for sure the volume of their voices were high. Because other prisoners were listening to them. You know, last Sunday, Brother Charles opened up about singing. And Brother Kennedy as well was talking about our singing. You know, you know thank you, brothers, for you know, warming it up for all of us. Because soon I will be, I will be going there. <laughs> I will be talking about singing. <laughs> you know, and you know, I remember Brother Charles. He was talking to me and uh, Brother Rex last Sunday about uh, their preacher way, way back. You know, their, their song leader, their preacher was telling them, I don't want to see your pretty faces when you're singing. I want to see your ugly faces when you're singing. You see, that's why I quit my singing career. 
<laughs> that is why I also quit going to the gym because it makes my face ugly. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, but kidding aside, let us sing our hearts out to the Lord. Right? Just like Paul, because he was happy. Now, when the bond servant gives himself to his master for life, the basis of which, again, is love. He saw a caring, a loving master. He found a real family and a real home. See, serving his master is no longer a form of slavery for that person. That person is not thinking anymore that he is a slave, but he is a family. Okay. It is not a slavery, but a form of freedom to enjoy life in his master's home. It is an opportunity for the bond servant to show his gratitude, to show his love, to show his loyalty by being fully obedient to the master. Now, the relationship is based on love rather than humiliation, rather than dishonor, rather than misery, rather than defeat under a rule of an evil man. No. It is now a family love relationship because he found a real treasure in the family. That's why he commits himself to be forever a slave. A truly Christ-centered life is a lifelong commitment to Christ. You know, the only time we're going to retire as Christians, as servants of God, here on earth is when we die. There's no retirement, better charge. Until we die, better Derek, right? Until we die. That's the only time we're going to retire. But, you know, be of cheer, as they say. After which, you will receive your retirement pay. <laughs> you will receive your retirement pay in heaven. The moment you said yes to God, as God, as our witness, you become his slave. You become his bond servant. You work, now your work is to do whatever our Lord Jesus tells you to do. You relinquish your right. Remember, you are not your own. Just like Apostle Paul, you must be ready to suffer. And when you do, and you will, and you will, pray. And in that suffering, find real joy. And sing because you are suffering for Christ. But rejoice in so far as you share. Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is received, uh, is revealed. Romans 8, 1 and 2, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen to that. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free, has made you free from the law of sin and death. You know, for Apostle Paul, this is what he saw in Jesus Christ. This is what freedom looks like in serving Jesus Christ. There is real joy and glory that awaits all of us. No condemnation and no death, but forever free in eternity in heaven. Look at the declaration of the other figures. James a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Epapras, who is one of yourselves, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. These New Testament authors and figures refer to themselves as bond servants, as slaves of our Lord Jesus Christ. Their lives were dedicated to Jesus as their one true master. They did not leave Jesus Christ. They all died serving him. These servants never leave their master for another. Now with everything said, my dear brethren and friends, do you consider yourself a true slave? A true bond servant of our Lord Jesus Christ? The question is not that we love Jesus. For I know your answer would be yes. 
you love Jesus. The question is, are you willing to give up everything for your love for Jesus Christ? Romans 6.22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit you reap leads to holiness and the outcome is eternal life. Brethren and friends, don't exchange eternity in heaven for a cheap change. No. Don't exchange real freedom from being just, you know, temporarily on parole. No. You can have your real freedom with Jesus Christ. You know, friends, please think like Paul. When he saw the opportunity that Jesus was giving him, another chance at life, he grabbed it, you know, he grabbed it by the throat and he never <clears throat> let it go. He count everything lost for Jesus Christ. Now, it is my prayer that it won't be <clears throat> too late for you and I, especially for those who have not accepted the Lord. Come forward and accept Jesus Christ and have real life and real joy. Be slaves for our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, may I request everybody to stand as we sing our song of invitation. Good morning.